Welcome, guys, back to the Grateful Living Podcast. Today, I'm thankful to have Vincent Rougeau on the podcast. Vincent is currently the president of Holy Cross. Prior to joining Holy Cross, he was the dean of Boston College's law school for 10 years and was the inaugural director of the Boston College Forum on Racial Justice in America. Prior to his role at BC, Rougeau was a tenured professor of law at Notre Dame Law School and served as their associate dean for academic affairs from 1999 to 2002. Vince, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, it's nice to be with you. Yeah, uh, thank you again. So, uh, you know, for people that don't know you, uh, set the scene, you know, take us back to the beginning, where you grew up, your family situation, what type of kid you were, things like that. <laughs> sure. Well, um, I spent most of my childhood uh, after age 12, pretty much uh, in the Washington DC area uh, in Silver Spring, Maryland, uh, right near Washington. Uh, but before that, we moved quite a bit. So I was actually born in Miami Beach, Florida, which is where my, my parents met and lived in Miami. Uh, but they're both from Louisiana originally. So they, through various things, ended up in Miami and met each other there. Uh, but for various reasons, for my father's education and for jobs, uh, they began to move a bit. So we lived in Chicago after that, which is where my sister was born. And then we lived in Atlanta, which is where my brother was born. <laughs> uh, and then uh, we spent uh, three years, my first three years of elementary school were in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where my father was in law school. Then we were in New York for a couple of years, a year in New Orleans, and then we finally ended up uh, in the Washington DC area. So that's uh, where I sort of identify as home mostly. But in terms of the kind of kid I was, I think when you move a lot, you develop certain strategies, skills to, uh, to manage that. Uh, it doesn't seem that difficult when you're very young, but as you get farther along in school, uh, so I mean, I was moving through, through sixth grade pretty frequently and moving to very different places. So I, was dealing with big regional changes sometimes, you know, New York to New Orleans, uh, very different atmospheres, suburban, urban. And uh, so I learned a lot about people at a very young age. And I learned a lot about the idea of acclimating or fitting in uh, the things that you could do to do that, the things that you couldn't do to do that. Uh, so, I often think that I, I picked up a lot of different skills at that time in terms of just learning how to manage, you know, very different kinds of people and feel comfortable in different settings. But I was a pretty bookish kid. Uh, I, um, I wasn't super athletic because I think another reason I never really got into any particular sport was we were moving quite a bit. So I never really got good enough at anything. And I wasn't, I, I, I felt I was very awkward as a kid. I did actually finally, as an adolescent, realize that I could run, <laughs> and uh, I did so did track and field for a while, uh, but I really did enjoy the outdoors. So I was a Boy Scout, and I did a lot of camping and uh, hiking, and I still enjoy those things. H hiking, at least, not so much camping now. Uh, so uh, yeah, I had, but you know, I, I knew that my my skills, I guess, lay more in the in the classroom. <laughs> And I really enjoyed school, you know, tried to do as well as I could and, and did well and uh, was able to uh, benefit from that in a lot of different ways, have great opportunities to do lots of different things. Yeah. As, as you, this is, I guess it would be a tough question, but as you look back, I mean, uh, for anybody out there that is moving a lot, um, do you have any piece of advice on making friends or adjusting? I mean, I, I guess... I would say probably join like a sports team or like, you know, what you did track and field that probably helps in making friends. Well, it would, except, you know, when I was moving, actually, I hadn't realized uh, I hadn't really reached that understanding of myself that I was good at those things. So I think a lot of, a lot of times though, understanding things that you enjoy and, and focusing on those things and you will find people who enjoy those things as well. That's a great way to, um, to deal with moves. 
if you're not extroverted, it can be a little harder, you know, because another suggestion is just to meet people, uh, introduce yourself to people. And, you know, people are actually usually more, people tend to be more shy, I think, than they like to admit, you know, they, they don't like to put themselves out there. But when you, when you're someone who's moved, you, you recognize that it's really helpful if people introduce themselves to you. So doing it yourself is a good way to break the ice. Um, and I think just joining things, joining clubs, activities, being involved in things where people can get to know you quickly um, is just a great way to handle the, uh, the stress. And it is a stress of moving, having to make new friends, uh, and it can be really, really hard. So I don't want to minimize it, but I do think that when it happens, you can take that experience and learn from it. Yeah. Uh, I did some research. I, I read that your father was involved with the civil rights movement. Is that correct? That's right. Do you, do you remember um, much of that? Uh, I don't remember a lot of it because most of it happened before I was born or when I was very young. Uh, but it was I, what I do remember and what uh, has stayed with me is that it was a very important part of the things that he did after that experience formed a lot of the things that became important in his life and our family life. So uh, he, when he finished college, he worked for a civil rights organization. And when he finished law school, he went to work for the Urban League. And when he, when we moved to Washington, he was working for a senator. Uh, but after that, he worked in the Carter administration as part as the first uh, director of this Office of Federal Contract Compliance, which was an, a new uh, agency in the Labor Department that was designed to ensure that the federal government was uh, diversifying uh, the the people who were. Uh, engaged in business with the government through government contracts. So making sure the contractors had diverse workforces. So very early in my life, we were exposed to the idea of, you know, expanding opportunity for all kinds of people. And, you know, my parents really stressed the idea of making sure that we seized all the opportunities that we could, that were available to us, that, and that we also were aware of the fact that many other people didn't have those opportunities and that we should be working in the things that we did to help others have those opportunities as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, I saw that you went to Brown for your undergrad. As you look back at your high school journey, you know, for any students out there, you know, looking to, to get into a competitive school or to go to Holy Cross, um, do you have any pieces of advice on, on that process in high school to, you know, just prepare yourself to get into uh, such a good school? Well, it's, uh, I've watched a lot. I've watched with my own children just how stressful it can be, how much anxiety is involved these days in thinking about, you know, doing well and getting into a good college. I think you should always remember that um, you tend to do well with, in things that you're really passionate about. So don't forget to you know, move towards your passions, towards things that really give you a real sense of joy and engagement, you will do well in those things. Now, obviously in high school, there are things you have to do. You may not enjoy as much and you have to take them, but you will pick up skills in the things that you really feel engaged with or that you excel at that can teach you uh, about how to apply yourself in areas where perhaps you're not as, as strong or you're not as interested. And really what you wanna do is develop skills of being uh, an engaged student, you know, a, a critical reader, a good writer, uh, you know, an analytic thinker, the, you know, things that science teaches you, things that English teaches you, those are skills that you'll need for the rest of your life. So if you think about it, I'm developing life skills that are going to get me uh, to all kinds of different places, not just college, I think it's a little easier then to, to deal with the things that feel more like a grind. But at the end of the day, too, I think it's important not to think of college or the selection of a college as some way of keeping score. I think people are often driven by a sense of, uh, you know, brand or, or, or elitism that makes them feel that if they don't get into a certain school, they haven't achieved. You know, there are so many great places to be educated in this country and around the world. And what you really want to do is match yourself to the place 
that will really help you excel. And that may not be the place that your best friend is going or that you know other people in your high school are going to. So you really have to spend a little time knowing what's important to you and what makes you thrive, what kind of environment where you, will you be, be successful in and uh, open yourself up to new types of choices that maybe your friends aren't considering. Yeah. You know, I saw you studied international relations um, at Brown um, and right after went uh, for your JD at Harvard Law. I'm curious, you know, was that something you knew going into college that you wanted to go to law school or how did that develop? Well, I didn't know when I went to college that I wanted to go to law school. I, I knew there was a possibility, obviously having a father who was a lawyer helped that, but I really wanted to see if there was something else that I wanted to do. And when I first went to college, I was really interested in international affairs as I ended up studying and uh, perhaps going into the foreign service or being a diplomat. That was what was really motivating me at the time. And I spent my junior year of college abroad in France. Uh, I was really passionate about learning languages. And so I really did a deep dive into French and I liked to travel and I wanted to you know, see the world. So I, uh, those were my passions at the time. And you know, I applied them to my learning through international relations. But after I came back from France, I, um, I started to see that maybe going to law school would open up another other avenues for me uh, beyond simply what I had been thinking about in terms of you know international affairs, and that could still be a part of my learning in law school, international law and those areas. So it seemed at the time that going to law school wasn't really closing off opportunities; it was really expanding them. So I took that took that route and. Uh, at, as I got into law, as I think happens to a lot of people, you start getting more drawn into the track of being a lawyer. Uh, so that's that's initially what I did. But ultimately, I found out that what I really enjoyed was uh, academic life. And so I ended up moving into becoming a professor. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, you know, 1981 to 1985 in Brown, um, as a minority, as a person of color, you know, how, how was that experience? I, you know, I can't imagine, you know, Brown's population of African-Americans was huge. So um, how, talk to us about that experience. Well, it wasn't huge, but I have to say Brown and a lot of the Ivy League schools at the time had done a lot of work in terms of uh, expanding the diversity of their, of their student body. So it did not feel like I didn't feel particularly isolated. There were lots of students of color, at least you know, for the time um, at Brown. Uh, and you know, I was struck actually by the diversity of those students. You know, they were from all over the country and all over the world. And so it was um, it it was a good a good experience overall in that sense. I think what was very different then from now and we're seeing this in some of the issues that are occurring on campus is, you know, students of color at those schools still, I think, felt that they were, they, their voices were a bit more constrained. I mean, we weren't really there to, um, to make any major changes to how the place worked. Uh, we were there to kind of be brought into the environment that was being presented to us. And that could create some tensions. I think even in the 80s, still people a lot of students of color felt that they didn't have access to the range of, of opportunities and ways to uh, express their, their distinctive voices to the extent that would have been uh, ideal or that would have been you know, realistic and meaningful for a, a real sense that we were part of the, the community in our, in, as our full selves and not as people who had been invited in. Um, and you know, that was a process of transition and, ch and change that had been going on for 20 years before. And by the time, um, you know, by the time we get to today, I think we see a very different understanding of the, the ways that these communities are, so, are meant to reflect diversity, the, 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 our understanding of diversity and equity and inclusion, which we didn't even call it that then, maybe we used the term diversity, but equity inclusion was not a part of it. And I think you can see how that, that changes the whole conversation. 
Yeah. As you know, obviously you have a very unique perspective, you know, from a parent perspective of having done your undergrad and now as a president of a college, you know, do you have any st advice for students on the making the most of their undergrad education? Best advice there is to think of it in, in sort of two, two ways. The first way is don't underestimate the importance of, of recognizing that the people at the college, the faculty, all of the staff and administrators, your advisors, all these people have some experience and knowledge that is valuable in terms of helping you decide what to take, helping you maximize the opportunities on campus. Uh, that is not meant to infantilize you, to treat you like a child, because obviously we want you to move through this process and, and leave it feeling fully adult. But at the same time, you, when you enter, you're just, this is for the first time for most young people that they're away from their families and their, uh, you know, their, their families of origin. Uh, so you, it's a transition. And there's a lot that you can learn from people who have helped people through this transition as part of you know, the work that they've been doing in their professional lives. Your faculty have a lot to offer you. So just be open, be open to uh, what they might have to tell you. And that's not to say that you have to do everything that, you're, that they say, it's just to say that there is an opportunity here to learn. Uh, and often sometimes I think students come in and they, they, they have this fixed notion in their mind of what they need to do and how they need to get there. And that they're kind of on this very focused track. And the joy of a college education is, is the joy of exploration. And once you leave college, there really aren't many opportunities to have that experience ever again. So be open to it. So that's the first side, you know, listen to the advice that you're getting, absorb it all. The second piece is something I mentioned earlier, and that's you know, take time to, to, to do some personal discernment about what really excites and inspires you and, and let, let that guide you to some extent. If you really have a passion for art, see what you can, uh, where you can go with that passion while you're in college, even though you think you should be a business major or whatever you think yeah, you yeah. should be doing, don't lose this chance to really see if you have a gift there or to really nurture a passion that you have that, yeah, maybe it's not going to be the work your job, but it's gonna be something you're gonna carry with you for the rest of your life. You may become a banker, you may become a lawyer, but if you have nurtured your passion for painting while you were in college, you can paint for the rest of your life. When that job is gone or when you've moved on to something else in your life, you'll still have that. And you'll have the knowledge and the joy and the sort of enrichment that comes with it. So use your education for more than just, you know, meeting some goal you have for what comes after. Uh, savor that moment, savor, savor that time that you're in college for all that it can be for you. Yeah, no, that's awesome advice. Um, and again, you know, you come from a unique vantage point of having been a dean for, for over 10 years um, and having graduated from law school yourself. But, you know, for someone who's interested in law school, um, do you have any pieces of advice on, on discerning that process and, um, are there any telltale signs that, you know, law is the profession for them or anything like that? Well, some people, I often hear parents say this or friends say this about their children. Well, he or she really loves to argue, so that'll be a great <laughs> lawyer. <laughs> yeah. That might be true, but, um, you know, law is more than just arguing before a court or you know, standing up and doing a trial. So, I think you want to think carefully about what is it for you that the law represents in terms of an opportunity? How can you take the law and, um, you know, find something that it opens up uh, professionally for you uh, that will be uh, satisfying and uh, enriching in your life? Now, maybe it is because you want to help people who are really in need. And, you know, law is a great tool for that, uh, for helping others. Uh, who don't have access to the things that they need just to move through the world uh, with, you know, uh, the kind of uh, just, you know, dignity and rights that they, they should have. Maybe you want to be involved in, in more business aspects of law, maybe, you know, big law, as we call it, uh, or maybe you want to go into the government. There's so many 
things that the law opens up for you. Uh, so it is great in that respect. But I often find that students sometimes just think in a very general sense, oh, I just want to be a lawyer because it's a good job and uh, if people respect lawyers most of the time. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> not all the time. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a respectable profession. There, there's security with it. And those things aren't wrong. But a lot of people are unhappy in the profession because they haven't really discerned for themselves why, they, why they're in it and what they're trying to accomplish by being a lawyer uh, or being a legal professional. So I often think it's good to take a little time between college and the decision to go to law school to get a better understanding of yourself, of what it's like to have a professional job, uh, even if it's not related to law. Uh, to, to see what lawyers do or what other professionals do and how law might be related to that before you make the decision to, to get a law degree. But I do think getting a law degree is a great thing to do. It, it does open up a lot of opportunities, but most people are going to you know, enter traditional legal jobs. So if you don't like any of those, you, know, you might want to think a little bit before you, you know, make a big investment to go to law school. Sometimes I think people haven't really thought about you know, well, there's certain things that lawyers do that really aren't exciting, uh, but they're important. Uh, but if they really bore you or if they, you find them tedious, is that really how you want to spend the rest of your professional life? So, you know, it's good to take a little time, I think. To, and it doesn't harm you in any way when you're looking at applying to law school. I think law schools increasingly like seeing students who've taken a little time to do that work. Yeah. Um, you know, similar question, and maybe you answered it, but, you know, would you give to any current law school student trying to make the most of their three years, you know, do you have any piece of, of advice on, on that process? Well, law school is difficult. It's really hard work and it's rigorous and it take, for most people, it's a big change from what they're used to doing. So my first bit of advice is to, you know, just prepare for the fact that you're gonna start law school and you're gonna find often that you are confused and that you have a lot of reading to do that you can't imagine how you're gonna possibly get through it. You're sitting in classes trying to get a better sense of what exactly they're trying to teach you. And what's going on is there's this process of retraining your mind to think the way lawyers think and to understand the, the, the modes of uh, you know, analysis and uh, you know, writing that lawyers use. And you're, the law school is taking a group of people who've coming from all these different backgrounds, different disciplines, different undergraduate degrees, and trying to, you know, kind of push them into this, this uh, space. So it's, it takes a little time and it can be a little jarring, but persevere. <laughs> um, <laughs> most, I find a lot of students have a, like an aha moment halfway through their first semester that, okay, this is what they want me to do. And then they start appreciating and, and managing the, the whole experience of law school much more effectively. But it's real serious intellectual training. It's real rigorous writing. And you know, people who don't like to write, you know, people who don't like logical thinking are going to find law school really difficult. So make sure that those are, you, you, those are things you expect to have to do uh, when you get to law school and know that you'll have to use those skills and hone those skills. Uh, and you will have, I think, a much more successful experience in law school. After your first year, a lot of different things open up. There are the wider range of opportunities. You're not doing the same thing that everyone else is doing. So that helps, I think, people find in the second and third year. Law school is a little bit more enjoyable because, or you know, some people do, a lot of people enjoy the first year once they get into it. But I just think you can direct things more to your personal interests in ways that you can't when you're a first year student. Yeah. Uh, for your personal experience, so you were um, at Harvard from 85 to 88. Do you want to just, uh, you know, tell us about, you know, what you were thinking then and, and what, what you did after law school? Sure. Yeah, so I, I went to law school at a time when a lot of people went, um, particularly people who had liberal arts degrees, for the reasons I was sort of hinting at before, not exactly sure what I want to do, think law school is good, I have the skills that suggest I might do well in law school, uh, let's see what it's about. Uh, and I think I took a view of law school that was more of an intellectual journey. 
uh, than a professional journey. And a lot of law schools presented it that way. They were much less concerned about preparing you for work and much more concerned about shaping your mind to think like a lawyer. Um, I think today there's a bit more balance. Uh, there's a lot more emphasis on, on some of the, the training and professional skills you need. But even today, it's uh, especially at the more elite law schools, there's a lot of attention to the intellectual side. So, you know, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the intellectual work. Um, I, I don't know if I had really spent the time thinking about whether or not I wanted to be a lawyer in the traditional sense in a big firm, or uh, I did determine that I didn't want to be a courtroom lawyer while I was at law school. I didn't want to be a litigator, mm. but um, I still wasn't quite sure how I was going to use my law degree. So, you know, I tried to throw myself into activities in law school that and courses that were interesting as well as practical. You know, I was really interested in human rights and I worked on a human rights journal. I, um, you know, I got involved in, in things that, you know, re were related to international interests that I had. But, um, you know, I left law school doing what a lot of law students do. I had an opportunity to work at a big firm, which was attractive, paid well. It was, um, in, I, you know, at a, I'd had a summer experience with a firm. And so I went to work for them. But working in a law firm is very different from being a, an associate over the summer. And, um, you know, not knowing exactly what I wanted in the long run made it hard for me, I think, as a junior lawyer to really click in that experience in a way that, that uh, allowed me to really thrive in that environment. So, you know, I spent my first two years out of law school really struggling to decide if being a big firm lawyer was right for me. And to be honest, that seemed like a failure. You know, like I should, I should be enjoying this. I should be yeah. good at this. I should, this should be working for me uh, because I went to law school and, you know, this is what a lot of my friends are doing and it seems to be, but, you know, not, we're all different. And yeah. I, I had to think a little bit more deeply about what it was that I wanted. And as it turned out, it wasn't that. And so I left the big law firm and I didn't know immediately what I was going to do, but after about six months, I figured out that maybe being an academic was something that would be more satisfying for me. And so that's when I took the decision to maybe try to find a job as, as a professor. Awesome. One question that just came to me that I, I should have asked, you know, you, whether it's, you know, Brown, Harvard, Notre Dame, BC, you know, all of these are, are very good schools for you. When you look back, I guess, on your Brown and Harvard journey, how did you not get intimidated? You know, especially at like a Harvard law, there's so many um, talented people, you know, in terms of performing, like, how do you just not get caught up in that and still perform well individually? Well, it is intimidating. I think if people are honest, except maybe some people who've had such high flying elite educations in high school that they know that they're, they're really not going to have a major issue with transitioning uh, into an Ivy League school in this instance. Uh, for most everybody else, uh, it's, it's a big change. College, the shift from college to high, high school is, is a big deal, uh, from high school to college, excuse me. But um, the, I think you go in and you have to have a little confidence in your ability. You know, they, they admitted me. They must think I can do this. <laughs> so let me try to be me and be the best possible me. You know, I'm going to work really hard. And sometimes you are surprised and it goes beautifully well. Sometimes you are surprised and you, you don't do as well as you'd like. And that's not because you're not smart enough. It's because there may be skills that you have not yet acquired. You may not have gotten uh, you know, certain things in your high school, or you may just, this may be something new or they may be pushing you harder than you've ever been pushed before. Uh, so you need to, to you know, up your game as it were. Uh, it's very easy, and I think what happens a lot is the way some people deal with their anxieties, their sense of intimidation, is they want to make other people feel the same way. Mm -hmm. So what, what I remember seeing, not so much in college, but I saw a lot of this in law school, uh, was, you know, 
people trying to send messages to other people that you know they could never they could never measure up um but you know in retrospect i think a lot of people were feeling that uh it's very intimidating to be at a place that you know is very difficult to get into and here you are surrounded by very bright people who um you know had to work super hard to get into these schools uh and you know they're you know and around you there are people who are, who are probably brilliant in ways that uh you know maybe you would not you're not going to match <laughs> but you're part of a community of learners and you're learning from each other and you're you're gaining a lot just by being in this environment and you should feel privileged to have the opportunity there's a lot of um you know imposter syndrome of all kinds you know, certainly for students of color students from low-income backgrounds you know even students from middle class backgrounds often feel like, why am I here in a, in a place like that? And uh, I think understanding that, that that's normal, uh, that it's okay to feel like you're out of place, but that's part of the, the transition. And that doesn't mean that you can't excel in this environment. And you, know, you should be willing to ask for help. There are usually tons of resources at schools like that that, that offer you you know, the help that you need to, to succeed. Because the idea is succeeding. They, the schools want you to succeed. Uh, they don't want people to fail. They want you to get the most out of the experience that you can. So it takes a little work. You, you have to have a little self-awareness to get over some of these feelings. Uh, and again, I mean, 30 years ago, it was there was a lot less attention to these kinds of things than there is today. I think people understand better today. You know, things like imposter syndrome, and, so knowing that that exists and when you feel it, that there are ways to get over it, uh, you know, you should look for those opportunities to get the assistance so that you don't get trapped in uh, a situation where you lose this opportunity and aren't, aren't able to maximize it. And that would be yeah, a tremendous loss and a waste. Yeah, oh, that's awesome advice. Uh, so you're working at a big firm and then you make the decision to join Loyola University Chicago as an assistant yes. professor of lawyer, uh, law. Um, I guess talk to us about that experience and um, what that taught you. So the process of applying for jobs in academia was one of those light bulb moments for me because talking about what I'd like to do as an academic and teaching or research was really interesting and exciting to me and really set off a, a, a sense that I could really thrive in this role, um, but it was another big change. And it, again, these things don't happen overnight. So when I first got into um, teaching, you know, it, there was a period of adjustment. I, I had to learn how to teach four new courses my first year. Uh, over the course of the year, I had to understand um, a whole new set of expectations for, you know, that um the school had for junior faculty and how to meet those expectations uh i had to understand how to um to be present for students present to my colleagues uh in in ways that uh, were different from the law firm so uh those were all you know periods of adjustment and something that when i look back on it uh, surprises me now because i've been in academia for so long but at the beginning it was kind of lonely because being an academic is a lot about the things you do by yourself. You know, you're preparing your classes by yourself. You're uh, doing your research and writing by yourself. Yes, you have your other colleagues, but they're kind of doing the same thing and you come together for specific purposes and you have your teaching and your students, but there's a lot of time spent on more sort of individual projects, which if you're coming out of, you know, a big corporate law practice or the business world, where there's constant energy and activity and things happen very quickly, uh, the different pace of an academic career can be jarring. And there were times when I wondered, well, have I made the right decision? I'm sort of an extrovert and here I am spending a lot of time alone. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, you know, it, again, one thing I learned after this, these two experiences of different jobs is you have to give these things some time before you say it's not right, or it is. Uh, 
there, there, there needs to be a period where you're adjusting to new realities and letting them settle in. And then I think you find over time, oh, wait a minute, there's a rhythm to this and I now appreciate it and here's how I do this and it's working for me. And that's what happened to me over, you know, after a year or two, I started to realize, oh, wait a minute, this works well for me for all kinds of reasons and I can really enjoy this. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, so from 98 to 2011, you become an associate professor and then a professor. Uh, I guess, you know, talk to us about, you know, how you got those uh, promotions and maybe what led to those promotions and things of that nature. So a junior faculty member spends a lot of time, uh, you know, learning a group of courses that he or she will be teaching and, you know, preparing a dossier of articles that uh, will be the foundation of a promotion from assistant professor to associate professor. Uh, so, you know, learning how to discipline yourself to write uh, was, was a big part of that and finding the right projects for writing, mastering your courses so that you felt comfortable in the classroom so the students, and the students felt comfortable with you uh, was another, another, part, another part of that. So some schools today, uh, some law schools in particular, don't even have the assistant professor role anymore because today professors are hired often who have already done a lot of writing uh, before they've even gotten their first job because that's just been a changing expectation in the academy. So they don't need that time the way in my era, you know, being an assistant professor was about transitioning from being in say the practice of law to becoming an academic. So the expectations were a little different, but that transition from assistant professor to associate professor was one where now you have tenure and you know, you're, um, you are in a field where you have some knowledge and you're able to really dive more deeply into, into your writing at a higher level. Um, you take on maybe new responsibilities as a faculty member running committees, uh, maybe running academic uh, programs. Uh, so, you know, you have a bigger, bigger plate. And uh, you know, when I became a tenured professor shortly thereafter, I got an offer to move to Notre Dame. And that's when I you know, got an opportunity to be an ac the academic dean uh, so that was a new, new opportunity for me to learn a little bit about academic administration. And little did I know at the time that that would be something that I would take on later in my career in a much larger way. So those new experiences of learning, more responsibility, you know, more leadership opportunities as a faculty member are you know, part of that journey from assistant to associate. I became a full professor after that. And uh, you know, from there, I became a dean. Yeah. I'm curious, do you have any advice on patience? Because I'm looking at, you know, 91 to 98 as an assistant professor of law, and you tell some young person now to wait seven years before a promotion. <laughs> That's a tough task. Um, you have any advice on patience? Yeah, patience is critical in life, in all areas. And I do sense a lot of young people today want things to happen so quickly that they're not getting the experience of recognizing that you know, spending time in something is really important to, to be able to master it properly, to understand nuances, to you know, build the confidence that um, you will need to take on the challenges that come with the next step. You know, like everyone now, you know, wants to retire by the time they're 50. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. just, uh, you know, but there's a 35. lot of learning. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> there's a lot of life learning that occurs in these different stages of your life. Uh, and, uh, you know, I went into academic life relatively young, so it didn't um, really seem problematic to me, you know, to go through these, these steps because, you know, I was a full professor in my 40s and that's not at all unreasonable. And I, um, I was able to do lots of different things. I had 20 years of being an academic, being a professor, um, more or less before I became a dean. And, um, you know, all things need time. 
And if you, you know, fly through them, uh, you may do fine. I, I'm not saying some people do, but I think you lose uh, a lot of important development opportunities, how to deal with people. Every time you go through a difficult situation in life, for instance, that kind of imprints in your brain uh, the patterns and things that, that signal to you in your, in your future life. Oh, wait a minute. I've seen this before, and this is how that worked out. If you've never seen it, then, you know, if the first time it happens to you is when you're in your 50s, it's a little bit more jarring than when you're saying, oh, well, wait a minute. I remember that happened when I was a junior faculty member or whatever. So, you know, I think people need to recognize that, you know, life is a journey. It's not a race. <laughs> and if you try to run through it and to get to the finish line, well, you know, when it's over, it's over. You know, <laughs> uh, yeah. And what are you going to look back on as kind of the more meaningful aspects of, 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 of your life. And so, yeah, I think it's really important to give things time. Uh, be not as long as, you know, different generations have a different view of how long it should be. But I do think people are rushing a lot these days and young people in particular uh, would benefit from, you know, pausing. <laughs> maybe stay in that job more than a year and just see <laughs> what yeah. happens. You know? uh, if you want to leave after two years, leave after two years, but there's something, a year isn't very long in a lot. You know? it, it takes a couple of years just to get your bearings sometimes. So yeah, I would definitely counsel that. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I forgot to say, so 98 to 2011, you were at university of Notre Dame. Uh, you moved from associate professor to professor to academic Dean. Um, I guess, I'm curious, you know, professor to Dean is quite a transition. Um, as you look back on that, you know, how, how did you manage that? Well, I think when you are a professor and you're doing the things that professors do, like running committees or being involved uh, in working groups in your field, professional associations, whatever, giving talks, you start to understand you know, various skills that you may or may not have. And so I think I, after being academic dean uh, early in my time at Notre Dame, I think I realized that you know, I had some interest and some affinity for, for being in academic leadership in some capacity. I didn't know exactly, I didn't know if it was gonna be a dean, but. I, I thought, well, these are things that I think I can do. And I had other opportunities to do things like chair the appointments committee, the hiring committee. Uh, and I think once you've had several of those experiences, and again, this is why time is important, and you pull those together, you say, well, these are the different pieces that make up how you run the law school. You know, there's the hiring, there's the academic uh, affairs, uh, the course, uh, the curriculum, the course scheduling, dealing with students. Um, and I, think now maybe I'm in a position to understand that at, the, at a higher level and maybe be a dean. And the other piece is people see that in you as well and they start offering you opportunities or asking you if it's something you'd be interested in doing. So, so it's not like a switch going on and off. It's more like a dimmer. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, the, you know, the light is getting brighter over time and suddenly there's this bright light saying to you, hey, it's time, you, you should think about being a dean. So that's sort of how it happened for me. I think it was a process of a few years where I thought, you know, people keep asking me if this is something I'd be interested in. And I've done all these things and now I've done this new thing and they're all starting to come together. Maybe I should uh, apply and see what happens. And it, the first time I applied for deanship, I didn't get one, uh, but I learned a lot in that process. And then the second time I did, I got, I got a great one and one that I really came to love and I spent 10 years in. So. Uh, it was, uh, again, it's another, another indication of why it takes time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. During this process, uh, you know, I assume there's a lot going on in your personal life too, while you're, you know, um, moving up professionally. I'm curious, you know, how, how did you balance those two aspects? Yeah, that's really, really important. I think, uh, if your personal life is not attended to, you know, your professional life is not going to go well. Um, I've been enormously fortunate in having a great spouse, partner, 
uh, who also has a professional career. And we've always been partners in thinking about how we will, as a couple, uh, manage uh, our lives uh, together, our professional lives together. And we knew from the time we got married uh, that we wanted a family. And so we knew that we would have to make adjustments for that to work. So in my case, you know, my wife, who's a physician, uh, decided relatively early in her career that working part-time, you know, three-quarters time, half-time, whatever it was, would be the way for her to feel that she was in a good position to maintain the responsibilities she wanted, that she had taken on as a mother. And my being an academic in a, was a way, too, for me to have a much more flexible schedule uh, at, that allowed me to be much more involved in you know, my family's life, my children's lives. It didn't mean I wasn't busy a lot. It didn't mean I was always there when I wanted to be, but it just meant that I think we were able to craft a family life where we, that was a priority. We, you know, we made decisions about jobs that we took or places that we lived that would allow us to keep our family at the center of what we wanted to do. And um, I would guess advise anyone to make sure that whatever it is about in your personal life that's really core for you and that's really important, if it's your partner or your children or both, or if it's uh, some, uh, some other commitment you may have, a religious commitment, uh, you know, a personal commitment of any kind, elderly parents, don't ever compromise that. You, know, you build your life around those core things. And that includes your professional life. If your professional life is preventing you from being a whole person, uh, that's not, you know, no job is worth that. No job is worth compromising your dignity as a human being or your, your relationships with people who are important to you. And of course, unfortunately, for many people, that's what happens. You know, the, their lives fall apart because they're not able to, to craft that balance. And it's not always easy to do, and you usually can't do it alone. You need help but you have to know what it is that's important to you and how you want to protect it. Yeah. Um, while we're on the topic, any uh, advice on, you know, becoming a father or preparing yourself for fatherhood? <laughs> well, it's almost impossible to prepare for being a parent. <laughs> it's uh, for everyone. I think it comes, you know, as a, it's easy to become a parent, but uh, once you once the child arrives, it's uh, every day is a, is, is a new uh, a surprise, a new challenge. But it's also one of the I mean, one of the, I can't think of many anything really more fulfilling than than, than raising children and, and you know, more glorious than seeing them you know launch their lives. Uh, you know, I think recognizing that you're not perfect and the parenthood is not a, is, there's is not um, a game of creating perfect children. Um, it's recognizing the joy and mystery and sometimes disappointment of, of, of the human experience. But primarily it's just about this sort of overabundance of love that you are able to share with another human being. You know, you produce these human beings and then you love them to death and you want the best for them but you can only be who you are as a person and you hope that you can give them what they need. You want to protect them. You want to uh, give them opportunity and joy, but in every human life, there will be disappointments. There will be, unfortunately, some will have tragedies. Uh, and you just have to prepare to just be uh, open to the journey and, uh, I find sometimes that a lot of young parents are so worried about making sure everything is perfect that they're not experiencing the the the, the, the unbridled joy of being a, of parenthood. You, know, you don't have to have the perfect job. You don't have to have the perfect house. I often say to people, you know, when your kids are young, they can sleep in your bedroom. You, know? <laughs> yeah. you don't need a big house when they're little. Um, you know, they, over time, yeah, that doesn't work very well, but. You know, the idea that you have to have like the perfect bedroom for every, all these children who haven't even been born yet <laughs> before you can have them. No, you know, yeah. have the kids, have a life, make a life, find, uh, enjoy the journey, enjoy the time. 
Yeah, I, I probably should ask this question before, but uh, I'm curious, you know, for all the the people that are single in their 20s and 30s, do you have any pieces of advice on, you know, finding the one and then once you get married, you know, making sure that the relationship continues to to be solid? Well, one thing I would say is you, this idea that you, you're going to just, the right person is just going to show up and you're going to find that person and then it'll all kind of click later. That's a big risk. You know, a lot of people tried that and later in their lives, they haven't found the person and they've missed some opportunities, perhaps for even having children in some cases, uh, at least their own uh, naturally. I mean, obviously there are many ways to have children, but um, I, I would say, you know, if it's important to you to find a life partner and to make have a family with that person, then that has to be one of your priorities. I mean, you have to place it in the space of how you make your decisions, how you spend your time, uh, where you spend your time. You know, if you really want that, uh, don't leave it to chance. Uh, spend some time thinking about, well, how will I build those relationships? Because obviously, if, if you're going to have a life partner and a stable relationship with that person, you want to, you're going to need to spend time building a relationship that will have the strength to endure. Uh, so uh, be open, you know, be open to dating, be open to being introduced to people. Uh, you know, when you're open, those people will find you. But if you're too busy working, <laughs> you know that it's you know someone's not going to just appear in your office as your potential spouse you know they're yeah. um, so make time for that and one way to do that is making time for things that uh you're passionate about or that give you joy in life and you will often meet people in those spaces uh that share that passion or or are attracted to the joy that you have for that thing so um so i would do that make time don't put it off. Don't be afraid. And if you find yourself in a relationship that seems like it's right, another thing I hear a lot of young people do is, like, well, I'm just not, it's not time for marriage. It's not, I'm not ready. Yeah. Well, this relationship may not be there forever. And guess what? If it goes away, you, you may not find another one quite like it. That's not to say you won't, but it's just, wow, there was this, per there was this person and it was great. And we just didn't stay together because we didn't think it was the right time. Uh, well, you know, usually in life, there aren't perfect times for anything. So, um, you know, value what you have and assess it honestly. And if it really is everything that you want in a partner um, and, and you want in a relationship with a partner, you know, maybe it's sometimes there's, it's worth the risk of, of moving forward. So um, that's another thing I think people have to feel that they're willing to do sometimes. You know, nothing is without risk. Nothing is perfect. You know, jump. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> jump. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think people find that, um, you know, they can, a relationship, a marriage is constant work. Uh, you're going to have to work on it. But it's a lot easier to work on something that, that you know, you went into joyfully and full of hope and, ex and excitement than something that you kind of backed into, a, you know later because you felt like you needed a man, you needed a partner, you know? Mm. So, uh, you know, look for the joy. And if you find that joy with someone, don't underestimate its value. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just curious, you know, raising, uh, you know, a person of color, were there conversations with that you had with your children, um, on race relations in America or, and when did you do those if you did those oh absolutely and i have three sons so those you know raising black boys in the united states of america requires some difficult conversations and you know involves a little bit of heartbreak uh sometimes a lot of heartbreak early on i mean one thing you notice what we noticed raising our sons is you know the way people interacted with them uh particularly people who didn't know them, you could see the shift. The closer they became, at, they came to adolescence, the more there was sort of this, you know, vague sense of threat or the less often they seemed to be, you know, just more naturally welcomed into things that I, you know, remember my oldest son telling us when he was young once, he noticed that people didn't smile at him as much 
as they had when he was younger. And he didn't understand why, but we did. And, you know, that's heartbreaking to have to have a conversation with a child about the fact that, well, because you're, you're a black male and you're tall and for your age, there are a lot of people in the world who've in, who just perceive you in a threatening way. And, you know, that's one of the unfortunate realities of being a person of color in this society. Um, and that was some time ago, but unfortunately I don't think it's changed as much as it, uh, it should have, or the fact that we're still talking about it and it resonates is a sad indication of that. But yes, um, that's just a constant um, part of living life in this society as a person of color. And in, as I said before, when you have male, black children, uh, there is that other layer that uh, there's this sense that their lives are in a certain level of danger that wouldn't otherwise be the case were they not black males. So you are trying to navigate uh, centuries of built in racism in this society that, you know, I don't think a lot of people necessarily see, they don't see it in themselves. They don't, and maybe it's not in them, but it's something the society has nurtured, which is why we're having these very important, but often very difficult conversations today about structural racism, about police violence and all of these things. Those things didn't happen by accident. I mean, they are baked in to uh, American culture. So our work needs to be to you know, dig them out and destroy them. We need to move this society to a place where we value humanity and all of its difference without the burdens of institutionalized you know, racism uh, or structural racism. And you know, I think that can be done or we can certainly make it better, but we just have to all be committed to the work because why would we lose the incredible value of all of these young people uh, to this burden, this weight of a very twisted and you know, ugly racial history that we have in this country when in fact, you know, they have so much potential to offer this society. And if they were unburdened by that, so much more. Yeah. So, um, you know, you're, you're forming a family, you're prospering at Notre Dame, and then uh, BC Law School calls in, in 2011, uh, and, and you're the dean there for 10 years. Um, you know, curious, you know, um, just anything, you know, from a leadership advice or any lessons that, um, you know, going to BC has taught you? Well, I think the big lesson I learned going to BC wasn't so much about going to BC per se, but it was moving from being a faculty member uh, and understanding how legal education worked from the experiences of the previous 20 years to a period of time where so much changed. You know, we had the big recession in 2008 and a lot of things that we had taken for granted in terms of how law school works, how, you know, why students come to law school, what they needed, how law firms hired, how the legal profession hired, all those things started to be contested and changed and uh, questioned. Uh, so we, so I became very aware of the fact that in academic life in this country, in, in legal academia, we had to become much more flexible, much more resilient in ways that were new to us. We had to be more creative, more dynamic. Uh, and that had not traditionally been the way academic life was. It was a little more you know, steady and slow, as I said before. Uh, and now we we're being asked and forced in many cases to make changes uh, or to contemplate different ways of doing things that were, were difficult in some instances. So uh, getting back to my early childhood and being able to understand that, you know, I needed to be flexible. I needed to rethink the way I was going to engage a problem or a person or, you know, be open to new ideas so that I could preserve the, the good things that this institution had to offer and continue to attract great people to it. So, uh, 
I think I've entered in my own career, and I think you know, legal education and higher education generally has entered into a new era where, where things are just going to be changing much more rapidly, where a lot of the things we used to do without question are now being questioned. And um, you know, I feel now much better prepared for it, having had, having had that experience uh, as a dean at the law school at Boston College, where we made a lot of changes and we were successful because we were willing to ask hard questions about what we did and to make those changes and to open ourselves to new ways of doing things. Yeah, I'm curious, how do you manage stress? <laughs> You're in, in the, you know, these big positions and obviously you just started at Holy Cross, but, you know, looking at your BC, you know, you're the dean, you know. I think um, for me, exercise is really critical. Uh, taking time for myself on a regular basis, however I can do it. If it's one way is obviously exercise. Another way is, is making sure I save, have time. I would have time with my family, have time to do some things I enjoy. Taking regular vacations. Uh, so I can turn it off. Uh, I just think you have to separate yourself from the role. People outside of, you know, around you may not separate you from the role, but you have to know how to separate yourself from the role so that you can you know, maintain a sense of sanity and oneness with your own person and your own values and with people around you. Keeping the people you love close so that they can help you and help you stay centered, give you opportunities to do other things give you ways of drawing boundaries uh, because people are usually pretty sensitive to the fact that if you say look my son has a, a, you know, a big event a concert a soccer game an important soccer game or um, you know someone's getting married or these things these things allow you to kind of draw some lines around your time uh, and you you need to build that into whatever you're doing in whatever role you are. Uh, it's funny, I was just at an event with a bunch of new college presidents and that was something that we spent a lot of, a lot of time talking about. Hmm. Where are the lines that you draw around your personal time, your family time, your whatever, even if you don't have a family, you deserve time for yourself it, that other people do not own. Uh, so you have to just be very conscious because it's just very easy to just throw yourself into the role and it can consume you and has consumed people. So you have to be intentional. There's, you know, obviously multiple functions of running a law school, you know, in terms of getting applicants, in terms of, you know, um, providing information to prospective students, providing a good experience for students, running financial aid, um, fundraising, um, keeping alumni happy. I mean, there's so much that goes into being a dean you know, I, I guess I'm curious, you know, how, how you managed all those aspects. Was it just doing a good job delegating or what was your keys? Well, the biggest way you manage that is that, you know, right away that you do not do everything. Part of being the leader in those settings is managing others who are expert at those particular areas. You have someone who runs the admissions operation. You have someone who is responsible for student life. You have someone uh, who is charged with helping you manage the faculty. You're involved with each of those things, but the, the idea that you could, you could be individually responsible for all of that and, and the sort of overarching running of the institution is just not possible and it's a fool's errand to think that you can you know know everything about everything uh as a leader that's not what leadership is i think leadership is about assembling great teams of people and inspiring them to be truly excellent at what they do and then using that excellence and bringing that together and that creativity to you know, solve the big institutional problems and to you know, create a vision for the institution that is inspiring for everybody. Uh, yes, as the leader, you step in and you have to understand what's happening. And there are certain things that only you can do. And one of your jobs is to know what those things are, uh, but it's not about doing everything. 
Uh, it's about knowing how to find the people to do it, to make them feel that they're valued for the knowledge and expertise that they bring to the table. And, you know, launching that uh, on behalf of the, of the institution. When you're evaluating someone that's reporting to you, um, how do you, are, are you looking for certain metrics? Are you just trusting that, like, especially if it's a new hire, like, you know, you bring in a new director of admissions or something like that. Like, do you just give them all your trust right away and then just tell them these are how I'm going to evaluate you? How, how do you manage that process? Well, normally when you're looking for someone in a role like that, you're, you're generally looking to see what, what they've done prior. How, do they have experience in this role in some similar context? And how, how did they do in, in, the, in their previous role? Now, it may not be quite at the level that you need them to work now. I mean, obviously, a lot of job changes are about shifting to another level. Uh, but what's the foundation that they're bringing? And uh, so that would be the first thing. Then the next thing I'd look for is what ability have they demonstrated to take on new challenges, to, be, uh, to learn, to uh, attack new problems, to deal with, with adversity, to adjust? If you have demonstrated in your previous role that you can make adjustments, that you can learn things, uh, that you're willing to, you know, take on new tasks as as required, that's a good sign that you'll be able, you will continue to do that. So you look at that. And then how do you work with others? Because as I just said, it's really about a team, right? And I want to be able to look to hire people who can contribute to the team, they know their area, they're expert at their area, they're not bringing problems from their area to the group that they should be able to solve on their own, but what they are bringing to the group are challenges that need additional input or strategies that they've learned from what they do uh, that will help move the institution forward. So um, there are no guarantees, you know, everyone makes a hire that doesn't work out or, you know, circumstances change, but I think if you have, you know, two, three, or four key metrics, key qualities that you're looking for in an employee um, or in someone who's reporting to you, that's, that's how you start. And then you give them, you identify things for them to accomplish. You know, here's where we wanna go. Can you get us there? How long do you think it will take? And you know, set realistic goals, but set goals and expect that people will meet those goals. And if they can't meet them, they need to demonstrate why, uh, you know, why they couldn't and if they actually can, uh, and that's when you make, you know, assessments, that's how, you know, you assess people as they're moving along so that you understand and they understand, you know, what the expectations are. Yeah. I, I'm curious, you've made several career changes in, in you know, different universities. And, and one thing I noticed is you spent a lot of time in each of the places, you know, Loyola, seven years, Notre Dame, 13, BC Law, 10. So clearly you did a good job of, I mean, none of those were, you were there for like two years, you know? Uh, I'm curious when someone's evaluating whether to make a career change or, you know, a promotion to a different school, are, are there things that they should, you know, research or, you know, do you have any pieces of advice on that process? Because clearly you've done a, a great job of <laughs> researching it would be a good fit and then it ended up being a good fit. Well, some of it is, uh, is luck, <laughs> uh, but uh, I do think this goes back to something you and I were speaking about earlier. You have to give things time. So I, you know, I don't think you jump out of a job at the first sign of adversity. You, because that adversity is actually gonna be an important learning experience. It may not end successfully. You may decide this, you've tried and it's not gonna work. You have to make, get a new job. But managing that situation, thinking through your options, uh, giving yourself a chance to learn, to maybe reset uh, your experience. As I was saying before, those are all skills. It's all information you're gonna carry with you throughout your professional life. So I've always tried to think carefully uh, about, you know, why am I here? What am I hoping to accomplish in this job? Uh, how do, how do I do that? How much time will that take? How much time ought I give it? And I've tried to stay. And when I've made a decision to move, it's been for a real 
substantive reason. I can't do what I want to do in my next job at this job. And I, um, I have learned everything I can learn in this role or, or I've come up against some barriers or issues in this position in this community that I'm not going to be able to change. Uh, I'm not willing to continue to work under the circumstances or I, you know, I'm not willing to change myself to fit into this, this uh, culture, whatever it is. Uh, so I need to make a move. I mean, fortunately for me, that hasn't generally been the issue. It's been more about wanting to do something new that I could no longer do at the other place, or it's about personal growth uh, for me, but not after I've done a good, what I hope has been a good job trying to contribute to the place where I, where I was so that it doesn't look like every time I hit a wall, I just cut and run. I don't think, when it, now I don't want to make it sound like it's not ever okay to leave after short periods of time, because I know the economy has changed a lot. Academia is very different. And young people today in particular find themselves in an economy that's much more dynamic and we're leaving jobs after shorter periods is, you know, it's not unacceptable. But again, I do think there are these core issues there. Are you leaving because you're just bored <laughs> or are you leaving because there's a real advantage to your making this change uh, for something that's really important? Yeah. So then um, 2020, Holy Cross calls and they're interviewing for presidents. Uh, I guess, talk to me about that interviewing process and for anyone going through a similar process, you know, how you manage that. Well, it was a lot like when I was discerning whether or not I wanted to become a dean. I, you know, I had been a dean for some time. There's a life cycle to being a dean, at least in my mind. I think you, um, you need to give it a good solid time, hopefully at least five years. But, um, and many deans don't have the opportunity to stay that long and they aren't able to really make any meaningful changes. They're sort of just more like caretakers for a period. I was very fortunate. I had a, uh, was able to stay and do a lot of things. I had a lot of great support you know, from my colleagues, from my provost and president. But I was coming to a period where I thought, well, is it in the best interest for the institution for me to continue to stay in this role? Uh, is it in my best interest professionally to stay in this role? Because there are things that I might want to try now that I've had a period of time in the dean role that I can now transfer up. So yes, when people started asking me if I was interested in the presidency, you know, first I was a little hesitant, <laughs> but um, but you know, as time went on, I, I saw the advantage to taking the skills and experiences I gathered as a dean and bringing them to the level of you know running the entire organization. I saw, in particular, a lot of parallels between law school and liberal arts college, and um, I had learned a lot about Catholic higher education since most of my all of my jobs had been in you know Jesuit or Catholic. Um, you know, at Catholic schools, some Jesuits, some not, one not. And um, so I was in a space where I understood the unique aspects of, of that higher education environment. And I had developed a set of skills that I thought could be transferred to a new level. So I thought, well, there's, a, there's still time in my professional life to take on one, a new challenge. And I wanted to do that before it became too late. And so here I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, that's awesome. Uh, I guess, do you want to talk about your vision for Holy Cross and um, as I transition from Father Burroughs to you, you know, um, what you hope for? Well, I don't have a whole lot to say since I'm very, very new. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm, I think the most important thing for me to do right now is to uh, listen and learn about the community. Uh, obviously, I know uh, a number of things that uh, I, I have I found attractive, which, which you know, caused me to want to be president. And I can say that it's, it's an extraordinary school, one, a liberal arts college with a, a wonderful tradition uh, dating back to 1843, the only Jesuit liberal arts college in the country. Uh, it has wonderful alumni that they've educated uh, and 
with alumni who are incredibly supportive of the school. Um, the students are amazing that I've met. Uh, uh, faculty and staff are, are terrific, really committed, really just really passionate about the place. So uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of the community and I'm really eager to hear from them about what their hopes and dreams are for Holy Cross. Uh, going, because as I said, this is a very challenging time in higher education. And I think all schools need to assess uh, the future in a really thoughtful way if they're going to continue to thrive uh, in an environment that's, you know, has a lot of, presents a lot of challenges from, you know, cost of higher ed to declining numbers of young people in the population. So, um, you know, how will we get our message out into the world in a way that resonates so that we can continue to do the wonderful work we have been doing uh, in, well into the future. Yeah. You are the first lay and first black president for Holy Cross. Um, do you want to talk about what that means knowing you're forever uh, cemented in history? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, a lot to think about. Uh, obviously the shift from, Jesuits as president to a lay person is a, is a big moment for, for a school like Holy Cross. Other Jesuit colleges and universities have done it, uh, but uh, Holy Cross is, uh, as I said, it was founded in 1843, so it's been a very long time that it has had Jesuit leadership. And I am very, I'm very much aware of, you know, of what has been handed to me and uh, i want to make sure that in everything that i do that i i respect the le legacy of that great jesuit leadership tradition not just the jesuit mission and but also the tradition of these great jesuits who ran, ran the college and learn from that but then also use the opportunity of now being a lay person to open up new possibilities for how the leadership can be shaped uh you know as a husband and a father and uh you know as a person who shares a life with someone who also has a professional career i'm sure that can be really meaningful for students who themselves are going to think about living lives of that type them as they go forward so i think it's a it's an expansion of how we understand leadership in this context and uh, but you know i i um i have a great deal of respect for for what what preceded me and i want to make sure i honor that you know, being a uh, Catholic, you know, I'm curious, there's, I mean, it's such a broad term, there's so much, you know, um, going on with the faith. Um, but, you know, for you, I guess, do you have any pieces of advice, you know, obviously, people are, on, as I said, all different spectrums of, you know, more conservative, more liberal, um, you know, in a time period where they're struggling with their faith or in a time period where they're strong in their faith. Um, just anything you want to say about that? Well, I'll use the other part of what you were asking me before to do that. So, I mean, as a, as a first Black president, as a Black Catholic, one of the things for me that I want to signal about Catholicism is much of what you said, right? It's a global faith. It's a faith that is found around the world. People are Catholic in all, every continent, every country uh, around the world, maybe not every country, but many. And the faith has always viewed itself as encompassing different cultures, different um, ways of life, different ways of, of, of praying, different ways, different kinds of spirituality, uh, different traditions. And it's an ancient in faith, 2000 years. Uh, so sometimes I think we, get drawn into you know, issues and concerns of our particular culture or our particular time. And that's normal, that's natural. But what gives me energy about being a Catholic is stepping back from that and looking at the broader, uh, the, the history, the, the, the cultural richness that Catholicism encompasses from all around the world and seeing here, even in our own country, how that multicultural dynamic aspect of Catholicism is growing. That's the future of Catholicism in this country and in the world. Uh, so how do we engage that, embrace that, and sort of energize that for the future? There will be political debates, there'll be conservative, liberal, there'll be you know traditionalists, progressives, but 
you know, what it, what's it, what's core, and you know, what is it that we we all embrace uh, in terms of why it's important to us to maintain and, and hold on to this faith. And for me, you know, it's about uh, the dignity of the human person, the fact that we're always coming back to the idea that that you know, there's this godlike dignity in in all of us, and you know, God made us all different, so there must be something to that. There must be something important about that, uh, and. The fact that we can embrace that difference and, and, and create community across that difference as Catholics and as Catholics witness it to others who aren't, I think is really important. So I hope that we, for me, that you know, we will push in that direction and, and keep moving in a way that allows us to be you know, ennobled by our, our differences, not be lost in the, the divisiveness that sometimes those, those differences can cause. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. You know, Vince, we, we talked about quite a bit. Um, was there a question that I, I didn't ask you or a question you wished, you know, mentees would ask you uh, more of uh, that we didn't talk about? No, I think you, you really did a great job of <laughs> awesome. taking me through my life and drawing out a lot of critical in things that I've learned from it. You know, I, I guess I would end with the idea that something I did think we did touch on, but I'll just reemphasize it is, you know, life is a gift and a journey. And um, I, I feel like I'm always learning and I try to keep my mind open to things that are, are new things that maybe I, I haven't taken enough time to see, uh, you know, people that, that have something to teach me. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's how, if you can keep your, your mind focused on the, a kind of joyfulness about the world around you, there are a lot, there are a lot of things to be upset about. I, I'm not trying to be a Pollyanna here, but there is also so much wonder and richness and gift uh, in, in creation. So, you know, seek that and learn from that and embrace that. And, you know, that's, uh, I think, the, not my secret to, to living, but just what I've, what I've used to, 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 to have a joyful life. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, Vince, I just want to acknowledge you. I, I really appreciate you, someone of your stature, coming on the podcast and sharing your uh, life story, professional and personal. I know that a lot of people, uh, for sure in academia, will uh, really enjoy learning from your story and, you know, learning from the lessons to, you know, how you got to where you've gotten to today. Um you know, and, and best of luck at uh, Holy Cross and, and uh, all that. Um, I, I don't know is if there's any way that uh, people can support you or Holy Cross. Do you want to uh, let them know? Well, just check us out. Uh, yeah. you know, come visit. Take a look at our website. Think, come see the things we're doing. We have some wonderful programs. We have a a performing arts center that will be opening up in a year. We've got uh, students doing great things. Uh, we have, um, you know, wonderful student athletes, student science and researchers and people doing all kinds of, of, of incredible things. Great faculty, really committed people. I guess the big, yeah, we're, we're open to, to meeting people. Come visit. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you for having me.